Right now, it's got a small decrease going on. It looks like they're losing about 1.5 students per year. Um, this is a turnaround. Uh, the last three-year trend had a gain of 8.5 students per year. This one, because of all the bounce that was happening to try to get a better feel on long-term possibilities for Randolph Elementary, what I did was I looked at the data going back the last five or six years. If you pull that data into it, it shows either a steady state or a slight increase. Short term is kind of hard to tell sometimes, then you go to, to, to the long term. But I do not expect Randolph Elementary um, to decline much. It might, might go down a little bit a year, might go up a little bit a year, but it looks like it's entering a period of kind of steady state. Questions on anything so far as we're kind of flying through stuff? Boring, but it's important. And budget, right? Is if enrollment numbers are going up, that means we need to be looking at more teachers, potentially. Yep. Compared to the state average? State average, uh, can't give you an exact number, but enrollments are decreasing across the state. It's been going on for a long time. That uh, was one of the reasons for Act 46 and the consolidation of districts. So RUHS, again, we've got this wide scattering of data points. Um, it indicates, again, predicting the future isn't going to be as reliable as if those data points were closer to the trend line. Um, we went from a steady trend of enrollment in the previous uh, three years uh, to averaging. So in other words, the previous three years, things were kind of even state. Yeah, they jumped up and down. They were jumping up and around, up and down around a certain enrollment level. Um, at this point in time, what we're seeing is that we we're getting at least six new students per year on the three-year trend. RTCC enrollments are going up. Um, they're coming off kind of a historic low for them. Um, right now, they're running around 137 students. Um, their goal, given the size of what they can accommodate, their goal is to have between 140 and 150 students. And right now, if we go back over the last three years, they've been increasing on average about seven students per year. Um, they've got some things that they're working on. Um, they've eliminated a program, the forestry program last year, and those students were integrated into agriculture. Uh, they are also at a point in terms of like what's happened across much of the state where the business program is dying. Across most of the state, you don't see a business program anymore. We have no students in the business program. Um, so these numbers are still pretty good given the elimination of that program and the state of the business program. Uh, they are working diligently to find replacements. Uh, they have a pre tech program um, that is up and running this year. They have a pre tech teacher. Um, he's actually going out and interacting with some of the, the younger students in the Northfield Williamstown schools and doing some work here with our students to get, get the students interested um, in what the technical center has to offer. And uh, Jason has, as part of his, his work this year, um, put some pressure on him to go to some out-of-state technical centers and see what kind of unique programs that they have that they can possibly bring in um, to replace uh, what was published. And we have, we have students that, their regional technical centers, they tend to pull from the same schools. Um, we have students that come here very specifically because we have programs that we offer here that the others do not. So we have some students that travel uh, a pretty far distance to the technical center. Um, our main demographic, talk a little bit about this. Um, go over the acronyms first, SWD students with disabilities. Uh, by definition for us in, in these charts, a student with a disability is a student who is on, is on an IET, an Individualized Education Plan. Uh, these are students who need some supports, um, some accommodations or some modifications to their learning environment to be able to access the curriculum and progress forward um, like other students. You'll notice um, this chart changes things a little bit. It's in a little bit different terms. On this side, this is actually the percentage of the overall student population in the district that's on an IEP. So where we're standing right now at 21% for this current year that we're in, that means that 21% of all the students in the district are on an IEP. 
And you can see that that number has been changing. It's been going up by about 1% per year. And you can see that that's been a pretty consistent rise. You can see that the data points are pretty close to that trend line, which means it's probably going to continue into the foreseeable future. Now, by comparison, um, looking over the na national data, by comparison, 14% um, of students in public schools nationally are on IEPs. So we're about seven points above what the national average is. This isn't just true of the OSSD, this is true of schools in Vermont. So does that mean we're over identifying No, what it means, because it's happening across the state of Vermont, and it's one of the pressures for the Act 173, where they're trying to change the funding formula for special education, um, it's actually inherent um, to things that are happening with kids. Um, there's lots of reasons a student could be on an IEP. Um, I tend to put them into two different categories. You have the students that need the academic support, right? They process information differently, either in terms of how it gets into the mind, into the working memory, or they have problems, they get the information and they have problems getting it back out in the So those are on the academic side. What we're seeing in Vermont is the other side of the coin, and it's something that we're not equipped to handle the way things are structured, we're getting a lot of students with emotional disabilities, which we've talked about um, over the past couple of years. Um, students with emotional disturbances um, are typically, not always, um, but typically the result of trauma at home. And so those guys are the biggest growing population um, that we have in terms of special education. The reason that it's such an expensive prospect um, is because the structures that we have in place across the state are really meant to handle students with learning disabilities, students on the academic side of the spectrum. If you're on, a, on the emotionally disturbed, right, from the emotional disturbance, uh, you need mental health work if you're going to improve. Schools are not structured to provide that. So you've seen a switch in the district over the last year or so. We brought in the therapeutic program at the elementary school. There's a social worker at the high school. There's a behavioral interventionist at the high school. Um, and a lot of that work is to try to bring in that mental health support that is actually going to have an impact on the needs of these students. Because sitting down and, and, and having somebody help you with some different strategies with your math and your ELA is not going to help this sort of and I think that's one of the things the state's grappling with as a whole, is they're starting to realize the mental health piece is necessary. It's just how do we do it? Don't we in mind, our numbers align with rural areas nationally? Uh, that I don't. Um, I can tell you, based upon the data that I was looking at in the last two days, it's 14% across the country as, as a whole, which means some are higher, some are lower. Okay, I was um, wondering if rural is you know, up near us. Yeah, but what what yeah. what the seven to nine categories, yeah. of the seven to nine categories there are for, for disabilities um, under, that, are, that are eligible for IEPs, mm -hmm. across the nation, emotional disturbances, they're down at the bottom of the list. Mm -hmm. um, with us, they're up here. And again, they've caused the cost in the state to go up exponentially. Um, because people keep putting resources towards these students that aren't designed to have any meaningful change. They can't. Students with disabilities at Braintree, you see it's a pretty straight upward trend. It's increasing by 1.7% per year. So 1.7% of the entire population of Braintree School as each year goes by um, is now on an IEP that wasn't the year before. A lot of it, uh, and we might talk about this data a little bit further along, um, a lot of it is as I'm looking at the preschool students that we've got now because we have a responsibility to identify those uh, that may need services. Um, the number of our youngsters that are coming in that need services is growing exponentially. So while we're kind of steady state at the older, older grades, what's happening, especially while you're seeing it at the elementary schools, is because as each new class of kids comes in, a higher percentage of them is having problems. 
students with disabilities at Brookfield is actually turning a corner. Um, over this last two year trend from 2018 to 2020, it's on the decline. Uh, they last year had the highest percentage of anyone in the district, 26% of the students. Um, they are now getting towards the lower end compared to the other elementaries. 2.29, 2.3% fewer students in that population are on it. On this trend line. Whether that will continue or not, it's unclear. Um, there is a little bit of scattering there, just some jumping up and down. Um, but it does appear that it's going to continue to climb for a while. Randolph Elementary. They are growing and have been growing at a fair rate for quite a while now. Uh, but what's interesting, and again, the programs um, that we're putting in place to address emotional disturbances went in, into place this year, so I haven't had a chance to affect these numbers yet. RES and the elementary principals have been talking about this problem for a while. Um, so there has been some work done around the mental health aspect related to these students in prior years. And while this is still on the rise at RES, the rate at which it's increasing has been cut in half. Well, it used to be rising like this, and rising like that. So there is some improvements there, even though we're still adding more IEP students uh, to that population. Randolph, um, excuse me, Randolph Union High School, um, they have also turned a corner. Um, for a while, uh, they were losing about 1% per year, and now they're set to gain about 1% per year. Uh, I think much of this has to do uh, with the trauma-based uh, emotional disturbance students um, at the elementary level who were coming out through the pipeline and kind of got to miss all the new initiatives that were being put into place. Like I said, uh, we didn't have any really solid programs yet, but the elementary principals have been working on it for a year or two. Um, these students that are getting in the high school now are students in the pipeline that just didn't have any opportunity um, to be able to take advantage of, of those services. So the high school for a, a couple of years we expect this to rise in terms of quality. But they do have supports in place to help them. Uh, those were put in two years ago. This is a big one. We talked about this last year, and I put the full trend line on the go back to 2015. Just to show how steady an increase this is, this is the number of students um, with autism or Asperger's spectrum, is what they call it now. Uh, used, to be, used to be called autism. So on average, we're getting about three new students with autism every year. Now, autism spectrum disorder is just that. Um, the amount of intervention a student needs depends upon where they are on the spectrum. Some are very low needs, some are no needs, some are incredibly high needs. The high needs autism students tend to be the most expensive to work with. Um, and you can see that our, our numbers are increasing. Right? Three students per year. Um, right now, I'm going to talk a little bit about Act 173. Um, I don't, don't mind saying it publicly. Um, Act 173 is about changing how we fund special education in the state of Vermont. Um, right now, how things stand is for every student that goes into special education, the state reimburses us a good chunk of the money that we spend on. What the state is planning to do in about two years is move to a block grant system. It's going to look at the total number of students you have enrolled in your district. Not students on IEPs. Total number of students you have enrolled in your district give you so much money per student, and that's the money that you have to spend on those students per year. Their argument for this is that, hey, the reason that we're going to be switching to this um, is to force schools to do better with first instruction to deal with the academic issues that they have, which is causing this wave of, of problems that you're seeing. The reality is, is the way the problems we're seeing have nothing to do with academic problems. They have to do with emotional problems. And so this move has the very real prospect of doing one or two things. Um, 
It's going to decimate the school budget, or it's going to decimate the taxpayers. Uh, the way that they have it set up. Uh, they have provided no service in terms of trying to put structures and programs in place to help the real problem. Um, so groups of the superintendents are getting together. Um, I was talking last week with, uh, with Bruce Lass um, from White Valley and the Suzette Bollard um, from Williams County Northfield. And what we're looking to do is maybe try to put a collaborative together so that we're handling these students in one central location that we're all putting resources into. Uh, one of the most expensive pieces of, of, of these students and the students that we send out of district is is transportation, which could be about $40,000 per year. If we did something like bought the, uh, the Vermont Tech Building that's halfway up Route 66, and put a collaborative in there, our students can go there, it would be much less expensive than the two to 300,000 it's costing us to send them out, and we save the transportation that could be pumped back in to support those students. Um, the other nice thing about the collaborative model is if we can get it built, um, is that open spaces can be used for tuition and students from other districts outside of our department. Um, they pay the tuition and help that offset. Um, so that's what we're looking at. State's not doing it, so we're going to have to. Um, and I'm, I'm very worried about what the overall impact of, of that one is going to be. Would that lane be for only students that can't be mainstream in the yeah, so this is a, you think of it as an alternative, you know, these are called alternative high schools, not alternative school. Um, it's a place for students to be able to access the curriculum and grow um, similarly to their peers where they just they need outplacement. And it doesn't always have to be outplacement permanently. Um, what's nice is if we set it up well, uh, I'm thinking mostly about the, the autistic students, um, but if we have students in the outplay place we do because of, of, of violent behaviors, um, because of trauma, um, in those cases, sometimes you can get them in there for 45 days to six months with intensive care, intensive treatment, and then they're able to transition back. One of the problems that we have now when I'm looking at our special education model is we put the services on the student, and then they're there from now on. You send the student out, they stay out as opposed to very guided focus where the specific behaviors that are causing problems, getting them to focus intensely on that, and then having the student transition. So a, lot of, a lot of discussions. But the, the autism piece is, is huge, it's not just here, it's, it's districts across the state. It's been happening across the country as well. All right, take a look at some standards-based tests, the ones that we have access to. I have to put a, a couple of caveats on this so people understand what they're really designed to do. SBAC, ACT, the new SAT that they redesigned in 2016, the Vermont Science Assessment, the AP exams. These are standards-based assessments, which means they're not really meant to compare one district to another. What they are meant to do is they are meant to measure a student's mastery on a well-defined knowledge set. If you take physics, this is what you're supposed to know. What these tests are designed to do is tell you how much of it you know. I know this much of that knowledge base, I know this much, I know this much. It's hard to kind of compare data across districts. You can do it, it's, there's some meaning to it. But the reason that it's difficult to do and it can sometimes be misleading is because if I say, oh, yeah, you know, our kids, 30% of our skid, kids uh, scored proficient on the SBAC, and, you know, Woodstock, 50% of their kids scored proficient on the SBAC, it doesn't tell you too much. It tells you that theirs learned 50% of the knowledge base, ours learned 30% of the expected knowledge base, but what if theirs just learned all the factual information, which is about 50% of the knowledge base, and ours have learned the 30% that required the higher level thing? So it's very hard to compare conditions. Elementary, English, Latin, language arts. This is SBAC. Uh, a couple of other caveats. Uh, based upon how the SBAC is structured, uh, the lower threshold that we're setting in this district for being acceptable is 50%. So on the SBAC, given our resources, 
given our capabilities, the quality of staff that we have, um, the generous support of the taxpayers. Um, at no time, once we're up and running the way that we should, uh, should our scores ever dip below the 50% mark. What does that 50% mean? If we're at 50% on this chart, it means that 50% of the students at the elementary level scored proficient or higher on the SPAC. Technically, in looking at things and my experience in other districts, given all the resources that we have, 70% um, should not be out of reach for that much change. We've got some work to do, and there's reasons, reasons for it. Um, but we've got some good things that are going on here. So we've got some mixed data this year, which is good. Last year, it wasn't mixed. What you see happening, this is a weighted average of all the elementary students in the district. And on average, every year that goes by, 4.3% more of the elementary population is hitting that proficiency threshold or higher. And right now, currently, across the district, they are well above that 50% threshold. You can see that that's a pretty straight line. You can see that the data points are tightly clustered around it. It's expected that that data is going to continue to rise. There are a lot of good things that are happening at the elementary schools and the work that the elementary principals are engaged in that are making this happen. More than 3% a year is statistically significant, and they're about 3% a year. Questions at all? We break them out by school. Braintree, they're increasing at 2.7% per year, but they're starting off from a pretty high place. Their low point on there is over 60%, yet they're still increasing. So probably within two to three years, they'll be at that 70% mark. Pretty much like the joints of Braintree. So Braintree gets the gold star. Their growth is a little lower than the other two schools, but their overall achievement is significantly higher. Brookfield, in terms of English language arts, they're starting out low compared to the other school, right? A little over 40%, but their growth, I believe, is the highest of the three. They're growing at 7.2%. Again, statistically significant. That means that it's due to the work that's happening in the schools. R-E-S-E-L-A, very similar to Brookfield. They're starting out a little lower, but they're increasing at a pretty good rate, 4.25% a year, and they are over the 50% threshold. High school. This is where our focus has got to be. And it's kind of nice. The elementary schools have done a lot of work early on in, in English and reading and writing. Um, more recently, the last few years or so, the focus has been math. We'll get to that data next. Um, the high school has had a little bit of a struggle, um, and not entirely their fault. For two years, the last two years, they have engaged with the state mandate right, to develop graduation proficiencies and standards-based report cards. Um, which was a 10-year project at best. So for two years, they developed that. They put it into place as best they can. And now they finally have time to move on um, to what is important as opposed to those state mandates. So at the high school, ELA, right, you see a decline of about 6% per year over the last two years. This is, I'm sorry, is this uh, um, grade 7, 8, 9, and 11? So, Vicki's making an important point we'll talk a little bit about later. When you're looking at the testing results uh, for the high school, they changed the grade, the, the terminal grade that the final test was administered in. It used to be ninth grade. Now, these results are from grades 7, 8, 9, and 9, and 10. This was important. So what you're looking at, and it's one of the things that I kind of hinted at quietly in one of the school board meetings, one of the things that we're going to work on this year, one of the things that we are missing, since these are most mostly middle school grades, we don't have 
available to the school and it's not operating at the end of the school model. And that may be one of the reasons for this impact. We're missing curriculum in a lot of areas, which is easy enough to fix. But we've got some other structural deficiencies that, that we've got to correct. The other part of this, too, that's going on is um, the students that are in the middle school grades right now. This is the last year um, that this characteristic can be claimed. Um, but the students that are in there right now are pipeline students. They missed most of the, the work that was happening in ELA, right, which started happening about five years ago um, at the elementary level, and the math work was started about two years ago. So these students have some significant needs anyway uh, coming out of the elementary school because they missed all that good work. Uh, the high school's been good. They've got some rich classes that are put into place to try to help out and mediate these students um, while they're going to be doing the curriculum work that they're going to be this year. Questions on English? Yeah. I'd like to see more of an observation is that with, with school closings, I think it's even more challenging because you're bringing kids in from all over to uh, acclimate yep. and test. And I think it's, it's a variable that you may not have been seen. Yeah. And I can. Uh, we have a number of students that are coming in through school choice. So 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th is what school choice usually gets. Um, we have a number of students that have been moving into the district, primarily in Braintree, but a lot of those are out of state. So it, it brings up a good point in that you don't know what you're getting. You don't know what prep they've had. So is this the only measure we're going to use to measure Evaluate how nope. No, right now, and a little bit of that's talked about in the ENDS report, um, the first piece that was put in for this year was they have mandated testing that is occurring for formative assessment reasons. So they have tracked my progress that you're using across the year about four times, and they have the interim assessments that tie to the SBAC. They're doing this for two reasons. One, because I can teach the, the, the kids a certain chunk of knowledge, concepts, and skills. I can test them immediately, know how they're doing, and then decide, do I need to change something? Do I need to go back? Do I need to reteach before I move on? And two, because it counteracts another part of the culture here that's happened for a long time, and that culture has been with this testing for a uh, And that is ubiquitous across the communities. Right, because there are other things that you can look at besides just standardized testing to evaluate how the well students are doing. Very true. So I just wondered, are we, so it seems like under your leadership, you're moving so next year, toward just more and more standardized testing and teaching through a test, which is one way to evaluate it. It's objective and it allows you to have an objective measure, but I'm just wondering if, as you work with the teachers and the principals, is anybody mentioning some other ways? You're all professionals. I'm sure there's probably some other ways that you can assess besides standardized testing. I work a lot with kids, and many kids will say, I am terrible at standardized testing. And you give me a standardized test, and my brain freezes, and I can't do anything. So I'm just wondering if we're going to put all of our eggs into standardized testing. No, what, what, what we're doing is we are focusing our efforts on the most critical we need. Okay. Um, the standardized testing piece, it isn't the be all and all. We already do a tremendous number of great things for kids. In terms of, of, of social development, in terms of just care, the kids feel they care about, there are a few districts that do better. Um, than, than what the teachers and what the principals are doing. Yeah, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about, you know, showing a uh, written paper, uh, a student researching something that has to do with using their English language or skills, but maybe not just, I'm producing the right response on this standardized test that can be objective and can be compared to other places, but are a valid way to show I do know how to write. I can read something and understand it and make sense of it and create an argument. And anyone who went through the report card process 
where the students led the conferences, they just so yes. There is I'm gonna make a very strong argument here. Um, you don't have to teach to the test, and that's not the goal for the students. What these tests do, not for every kid, but on average in general, give you an idea of the overall health. Right. In terms I'm, not, of I'm not saying we shouldn't be looking at it. What I'm asking is, are we going to look at some other things as well as the testing to evaluate how well students are doing? Given that some students, a standardized test may not be the best way for them to demonstrate what they know. Right now, this is the critical need. I cannot keep the rolling score up in this district unless these scores improve because it is the most visible thing that people see when they decide what they are going to do. We have spent two years mopping up the students um, from around as the, the schools have closed um, that were available. We've actually stolen some in terms of school choice because they'd rather be here because of some of the programs that we offer. But we're not drawing them in at least at the high school level yet because of the quality of instruction as people see it through the lens um, of things like SBAC and EP and SAT. Really? And the data we're getting that says people are deciding not to come here because of that? Do we have? Do we have search of any houses to say? And when you do the search, SBAC scores the next two years will be probably about And so maybe, maybe not, there might be data Right, so what, I mean, you can't just say, oh, well, people aren't moving here because of low SBAC scores. There might be several reasons why people aren't moving here. I can't, I don't think we can say it's just because of the SBAC scores. I can, I can state for you unequivocally that it is a major component behind the decisions that families and schools, children have at the top of their mind. It's one of the reasons that uh, when I was looking at a district where I was going to live, it had nothing. To, I did not look at whether or not the scores, the, the standardized test scores of the schools in the district. And I consider myself fairly well. One of the reasons that the real sites actually have that statistic on there is because it's what's put people are interested in. It's not. A, no, I'm, and again, I'm not saying we shouldn't be looking at SBAC. But I'm just saying there are there are other things, and I'm just wondering. But at this point, what I'm hearing is no. Your focus is on standardized testing and getting those scores up. Because you primary focus, but remember. And I think we need to dialogue with the community and make sure that the community is thinking that standardized test scores, the SBACs, that should be our primary focus. That that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that it's the wrong thing. I'm just saying what I'm hearing from you is that this is what our focus is going to be, is raising those scores. And that you think that's going to make our school more enticing to people moving to this community. So you have a science program that's going to be going into the elementary level. We have the reading program. We put in these there. Are open? And I complete the thought. We put in a coding set of coding courses. We put in a four hundred thousand dollar robotics program in high school. This is not the only focus, but it is our week here. Um, if the board should choose that this is not a priority, um, that is your work. Um, that is something that the, I think the board needs to to decide on. But I would argue that the argument that we're having right now is exactly, and when we get to the, the math scores at the high school, it's exactly why these scores are black box scores. 50%, these are standardized tests. So they take all the students in, they compare the grades, they figure out where the center is, they call that 50%, they call that proficiency threshold. 50% is not difficult to achieve. I'm not arguing for 100%, like I don't know a shot of market time, but I'm arguing for 50%, I'm arguing for 70%. Remember, I'm coming from districts. And I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. I'm just saying, are we looking at other things along with the standardized testing? That's all I'm asking. Yeah, but this because I'm not seeing that anywhere. I'm seeing a, a focus on standardized testing, which is fine, but I'm hoping that there are possibly some other things 
the value? There are, but again, there were 16 years of not focusing on this to let this district in the side state in terms of its performance. We got to be one. Thoughts, questions? Elementary math. Oh, to go back to the uh, thought um, along the way here is no one's proposing teaching for the test. These tests are an indication of overall health. If math teaching, math instruction improves, students are going to naturally score a lot. So we're not going in and looking at the, the test and teaching the specific items on them anymore. Anything like that. So I don't want that to be a worry. No, no, I'm not, I'm not worried. So in terms of elementary, um, again, weighted average of all the elementary students all together. If you take a look at it, they've been on the increase. Um, they're actually almost at that 50% threshold. They're actually 49.9% of the overall um, student body in terms of elementary students are hitting the proficiency level. And they're increasing at 4.2% per year. Again, indicating that it is due to the good work that's happening at the elementary schools uh, with the principals and the staffs. Brain trade, if you break the schools out individually, um, similar rises, right? They're going up at 4.15 percent, um, and they are at that 50 percent threshold. As a matter of fact, they've been above it at least once in the last few years. Brookfield math is falling, and I have to caution you on um, the student is scaling. That line is not as steep as it appears. Um, you can see that they're jumping all over the place. They're up, they're down. Um, so again, we can't tell much about what the true trend is going to be because the data points aren't close to the trend line. Um, based upon this, the uh, three-year average is minus 1.2% uh, per year. Um, some things have been put in place. Um, to try to help, but there are some difficulties as we've talked about in the past with the smaller schools. Um, we still have a little bit of multi-grade math um, going on just because of the inability to have um, all the staffing here. But as the numbers and all increases, we should be able to remedy that. Um, we have a dedicated uh, principal at the school now, um, starting this year, um, which should help a lot with the logistics, ensuring quality of instruction, um, and time all around. Um, and we're making a concerted effort to make sure that Brookfield gets the resources for them uh, that they kind of always traditionally have. Given the small number of students, you're going to see it like a fluctuation of the math. Yeah. Your sample size is not. Nope. Agreed. But one of the, one of the big concerns and um, Smaller schools, it really comes down to one of the primary drivers is quality instruction. You know, get the best people in, in doing the job. Um, but also, they're still doing a bit of a multi grade math. You know, they've done a good job trying to get away from it. They've done a very good job, like all the elementary side of increasing the time on learning now. Um, but that multi grade math is just part of it. They don't get the same amount of time on um, the students that they get the grade period. Like it's okay for the other subjects, but for a subject that builds over time, uh, makes it a little bit difficult. Randolph Elementary, um, they're on the rise. They're above the 50% threshold. Uh, they're going up to 4.15% per year. 4.15% of their student body. Every year, more of them are achieving the proficiency threshold. RUH has math. Um, this is one that bounces around a lot. I look back as far as I could go. Remembering that before SBAC it was NECAP. Um, technically, on the long term trend line, they're flat. They've been hovering right around that 20% mark. They tend to jump between about 18% and 24%. They've been doing that. So there's been no real decline. But again, the scores are very lackluster. Um, but there's been no real increase. Um, they've had a lot that's been going on in the department. Um, they've had a lot of turnover. Um, we have two teachers at those grade levels that we let go of performance issues. Um, we've got some really solid folks in there now, uh, and they need to do some pretty significant work. So make sure 
the students are engaged in, in what's needed and what's expected of them. Questions at all? Can't be trends uh, because this is new. Um, the Vermont Science Assessment came out two years ago. Uh, the first year they were just collecting data to make sure that the test was valid and reliable. Um, and then this past year was the first year that they released data on it. It was only about a week ago that they did. Um, but what it indicates, they test students in science in grades 5, 8, and 11. Um, so not as extensive as they do the testing with the SBAC. Um, if we compare it to the state numbers, grade five scored at the state overall average. Um, grade eight scored 18 points below the state average for this first real administration of this exam. And then grade 11 scored 10 points below the state average. Um, if I look at this and I think um, one of the concerns is that we've got no real codified, we've got science programs at the elementary schools, but not what I would call full codified science programs. Um, this test focuses heavily on earth science, uh, life science, and physical sciences. So unless kids are going into, this one, the last administration is 11th grade, unless the kids are going into these exams having some biology, some earth science, some physics, and some chemistry, there's one that can so that's something that we've got to talk about whether or not it's a priority or not. So we don't even have our science as far as I know. They, they're not doing tonight, right? Like the other ones now, they're, they're holding this for the left. Yeah, the logic they gave at the time, thinking back two years ago, was that you know, if we move them all to the ninth grade, they'll just, the ninth graders will have too much, too much testing. So we'll just do this one. One of the things I've been noticing with Vermont is they have to collect this data, they have to publish it to go after the federal grant money, which we get about 800,000 on a year. Um, it's, it's one of the requirements for it, but they've never tried to do much to do it. That makes sense. You know, it's not a high stakes, it's not even middle stakes uh, thing here yet. Um, so there's been no real driver, driver for improvement of the state. Uh, ACT. ACT. Um, is actually interesting. Um, this was one of the first kind of academic tests that was out. So what the ACT kind of looks at, it looks at English, it checks grammar, it checks punctuation, sentence structure. Um, it does some looking at how much knowledge the students have acquired in mathematics, primarily algebra one, um, algebra two, and geometry, uh, with a little trick thrown in. Um, it does look at some science as well. Um, it hits all four of the sciences that we just talked about. It checks out uh, you know, students' knowledge of biology, chemistry, physics, and earth science. Um, and it also checks mostly reading um, and whether or not students can pull the main ideas or infer main ideas from what they do that. Um, scores on for ACT, we're talking specifically about the composite, uh, the combined score um, of the math and reading components. Um, can range from 1 to 36. Um, the problem with the ACT has always been the low population size. Um, students that take the ACT typically are ones that self-select. They choose it over the SAT because they feel they're going to do better on it than they will on the ACT. Um, so these are usually the juniors and seniors taking the ACT? The, usually juniors and seniors, but the expectation is um, they can take it any year. Obviously, since this is a content test, um, the more content you've been exposed to, the better you should do. Um, the expectation that the ACT has the students have completed the test. I would say it's pretty atypical for someone who's not at least a junior to take the ACT. Yeah. Now, this is why doing comparisons on this one is so difficult. Um, on average, our students scored at 18, but 60 percent of the graduating class took it. Right? Vermont average is 23.6. Only half of them, half of our 60 percent, and only 29 percent. So they're self-selecting. The kids that think they're going to do well on it. But what you see when you look at the state breakdown across the country, the states where fewer percentages actually took the ACT are the ones that have the highest overall state scores. 
Uh, so it's hard to tell too much. This. National average is 20.8, but again, on the national average, um, they're taking a much less of a percent than we are here. Um, our high was a 28, our low was a 12. Uh, had we cut that, 30% you know, of our kids took it, or 30% of our, our highest kids took it, and did the math, we'd be above this. So again, it's hard to tell too much um, from these. Questions on? I'm going to throw a curve while you're at the end of this one, which is kind of interesting. Um, SAT, a couple things to remember, it was revised in 2016 um, to be an academic as opposed to a reasoning test. As of 2016, it is more like the ACT, it measures students on a body of knowledge. Um, prior to 2016, um, you had to have some knowledge to take it. It was beneficial to you, but it was an IQ test. It's, it's changed uh, completely in terms of what it's supposed to, to do. Um, typically, what you see is SAT is used for colleges on the east and the west coast. ACT is used for admission into colleges in the center, but that's been changing. Center of the country. Scores range from 200 to 800 on each section. And the two sections that the students typically take, or actually three, most of them don't take the writing section. Not that's the evidence based reading and writing and math. And it does test cumulative knowledge, so what you've learned over the course of your career up until the time that you took the test. Evidence-based reading and writing. Um, basically answering questions based on passages, right, in history, social studies, and science. So if you have some knowledge about history, social studies, and science, it's going to be easier to answer these questions. And our case, our scores have gone up from 2018 to 2019, um, from 511 to 525, with the Vermont average score. And again, in Vermont, they're pretty self-selected. I think about 40% of the seniors actually took it, for the most part do, um, was 560. For math. Okay, math concepts and problem solving through Algebra 2, some with a calculator, some without. Uh, 2018 it was 500, it dropped a little bit. 2019 it's 494. The overall Vermont average is 546 for the math section. We'll up here for a second to look at it and talk about it. Over the course of time, and this isn't diminishing our, our SAT scores. They're not bad, they're not good. They're in the middle of the pack. Um, over the course of time, there's been a lot of research going on since as far back as 1926 in terms of the SAT's ability to predict a, a student's college ability and outcomes. Uh, none of it's been conclusive. There is one thing conclusively that the SAT does tell you, that's the median income, family income of the students that take it. So if you take a look at our mean score, so our combined score, if you take the math and that evidence-based reading and writing, and you add them up, you get a 1020, which is our combined score on average. If you go over this research that was done in 2016, and you put it into the matrix, right? Well, 1020 is a little bit above 1012. So that means we can assume that the kids from our district who took that test, their family incomes were in the 60 to $80,000 range. And sure enough, right, it's a little bit above, a little bit above 60,000, our median family income was 67 to So it hit the nail on the head. And then given the 40% of the self-selecting kids in Vermont, that took the SAT, whose average score was 1106, right? A little bit higher than 1095, but not quite 1155. You know, average, I can guarantee you that the uh, average income of those families was family households, which probably around $60,000. So there is one, just for fun, there is one thing that the SAT is really good at, and that's how much you get. Is that effect been shown to be true for other kinds of standardized tests at all? 
There's always a correlation. Um, I don't think it's always this strong. No. Um, and there's a couple of couple of reasons for it. It's not just the availability of opportunity that comes with a higher income. Um, and again, these are stated in general, so it's not always the case. Um, it's the fact that people that are earning higher incomes, the parents are typically better educated, not always, which means they have a higher value on education for the students. And the second thing, and the or third thing, the final thing that it means is typically when you see people that are pulling in over that $140,000 range, you typically have two earners. So you have a solid family unit at home to help support the kids. Yeah, in average, doesn't mean in every case. So the, it's been shown, higher income, higher work Yeah. Yeah, it all goes together. A bigger concern to me when I look at those SAP scores is what's in yellow right there. Um, if you look at the breakdown, um, our female students in mathematics are way behind. Wrap up with some of the EP. What would be interesting for me to see that the four card was like that they would be able to which shows sometimes the difference between doing work, showing up, doing your homework, getting it done, studying for the test, doing the test. It may not necessarily show up once we're in the test. And that's one of the reasons though when we look at the standardized testing is because it eliminates the good student piece. So you've got a kid who's nice, never causes any problems, and grades tend to get inflated. Uh, but it's not telling me anything about what I really want to know. I want to know what they're doing. Doesn't mean that this they is perfect. They also can be good habits. They, they will go and get extra help. They will mm -hmm. do take it test. They'll get through. And oftentimes that's what's going to make them successful in the next stage of life, not necessarily a standardized test score. Yep. Not that that is not, I'm not saying you throw out one or the other, but I think it's weird that you've got to look at other. The habits are hard for mine aren't going anywhere. Well, I'm not. It's yep. not going to happen. Yep. Just a, a question on the, the male-female difference or disparity there. Um, has, has that been shown over time, or is that just one group of students? Uh, I can I can say it's been shown over the, the last two or three years. Okay. So that, that um, I think this is the most extreme year, though. Okay. Yeah. And it's it's interesting, and again, it has to do with with differences I think amongst the states. Um, outside of Vermont, it was the opposite. It was true for years and years and years. Um, you would have your students that were in the National Honor Society, they were all female. The top 10 in the rankings were always female. The California was always female. Um, so this is a little bit different than what you see uh, in a lot of states right now. Well, well this year's National Honor Society was five females and one male. Yeah. That's that's the norm across the country in most places. So this one's a little a little bothersome. Percentage of students that are taking an AP course. Now, interesting, we did some research when I was at Belmont, and we actually we found that students that took an honors course or an AP course, even if they weren't going to get an A in it, they actually learned a heck of a lot more from it than they did from a lower level course that they got an A. So what we're looking at is the percent of the student body at the high school overall that has taken at least one AP course. And you can see that that's been on the rise. So we're at the point where a little over 15% of our students right now, um, the student body at the high school is taking at least one AP course. And that has been rising for the last three years. It's rising to 4.9%. Every year that goes by, 4.9% more of the student body at our HS is taking the AP course than the year before. Um, some of that has to do with the number of students offered. There weren't, they increased the number. Yeah. But then we, I mean, this year, we also had to decrease because there weren't students. Yeah, well, I'll show you that there's some new courses, so I got a list of like the new and what wasn't offered that had been previously. They typically offer like between four and five. 
Um, there was one that dropped off this year was AQ Bio, and then they added uh, three or four other ones in, in, instead. The other thing that I think is really difficult to take into consideration with that is that we're losing so much percentage of the senior yeah. class to early college. I mean, there are very, there are only 12 or 14 seniors in the high school this year. So you can't, you know, we really count the numbers of percentage of taking these keys really because they're taking, right. Yeah, mostly, there's, uh, it's kind of funny, there's, there's one course that you can take as a sophomore. There's a good chunk you can take as a junior. There's some, depending upon how your sequencing is structured, that you can only take as a senior. Um, so it's a good point. Um, total exams taken uh, has been on the increase. Uh, we're pushing about 60 exams a, a year right now, so 12.5 more exams um, in the advanced placement classes than the previous years of the year. Yeah. I just, um, is there a graph for that shows how many college courses are current and how credits are current? No, but we you should do offer a lot. We should we should take a look. We should take a look. Yeah, it's impressive. The, and that was part of the because we're thinking we're thinking on different different pieces of it. That's what I was trying to point out. Some of the expansions of the program in there a lot. They offer more in terms of programming than some of the schools that are doing three point nine percent. So they do match with quite a few kids in a lot of areas, which is important. But one of the reasons that we focus primarily on the ELA and on that is their foundation skills. It's hard to be successful, really successful in your courses unless you actually have foundation skills. So AP, Calc, AB. So there's Calc AB, there's Calc BC. Um, AB is considered a first semester of calculus. Uh, BC is considered a full year, college year of calculus. Um, numbers are starting out low. Right, but they are increasing, and they're increasing at a pretty, at a pretty good rate. Um, so right now, the average score on the AP Calc um, exam is about a 2.25. Remember that the range of scores for an AP exam runs from 1 to 5. At a score of 3, um, some colleges will be getting considered students who have completed that course, they don't have to take it college. 3 is kind of a threshold. I think the sample size is tiny, so I mean, you could have one student in there. No. So, uh, this, this one, if I remember, there were nine or ten in this one. Some of them were small. AP English is on a little bit of a decline. Um, Add some validity to what we were seeing with the SPAC. Um, the two were, are, are patterning the same. Um, again, not much. Not much um, Oh, well. AP physics, a little bit of an increase. In terms of in general, um, most schools that have well-developed AP programs, in other words, the teachers have been offered the training, they've had an opportunity to work on curriculum with other teachers that teach AP on a, on a regular basis. Um, typical average is 2.75. You get the really high performance for all kids for the four class. Do you suppose that's the reason why a lot of seniors are taking the, the mass program instead of staying at the school and doing these AP courses? It's because oh. they are getting these low scores? I think, to be honest, so if you look at the AP physics, I think given the, the historical trends in mass scores, um, this is actually pretty impressive. Because you're not getting a lot of kids that are coming in with, with high level skills. My biggest concern my first year here looking at the things is the kids were avoiding even algebra two. So if we get those skills up so the kids feel more confident, they will. Um, VAS program, I mean, my eldest son's in the VAS program, so I can speak more for myself. Um, he went because they offered what he wanted. In software engineering, it's not something that's offered at the, at the, the high school. Um, the other thing that I think it's important to realize is that he's going to get a year of college under his belt, two thousand dollars out of my pocket. Yeah, I, I, that's sixty thousand for your already yeah. thinking like that. So I think I think a lot of it, a lot of it, more of it is that cost savings piece. 
least that's a significant chunk of money. I would say, and you probably have a win on this too, but like in the 10 years that I've been teaching at the high school, that's that's the thing that I've heard the most increase in, if that's what I'm bringing statistics to hear an increase. Like, you, know, you know what I mean? Like I, I think I'm hearing those concerns from kids a lot, more both as a motivation for why they want to take an AP class and or why they want to do dual enrollment in the class, but which I think is clearly a broader society. Yeah, I think, I think because of some streamlining, 
I just think the increase is what. So then the new ones this year it was the world history, the US history, statistics, and AP special, and I put the average scores up there. And again, you know, first year is, is a little bit tough. Um, AP biology was not taught this year, but it had been taught. Last year. Last year. Last year. Look at last year, sorry about that. Yeah, it, physics and physics and biology are going to alternate. So just put the parts and pieces. And again, other reason that we look at this in other houses is this is a lot of stuff. Um, so elementary uh, should be commended, right? We're making significant progress. Um, the one area of weakness that's going to be focused for them um, is they got to work a little bit harder on academic progress of students with disabilities. So when the state kind of went through the data, they said, hey, you know, there's, there's an achievement gap there. We all know that. We've all talked about it. But the problem is, is that uh, regular education students are improving like this, and the students with disabilities are kind of flat like And no, you can't do that. They've got to be the same over here. So at some point in time, the students with disabilities are progressing at the same level as the students that are the red. RUHS um, has needs for intense and focus for the next three to five years. Students with disabilities. So our IEP kids. Um, and a lot of that is just around basic curriculum. We've got good staff. That's not, not a problem. Um, we've got some very good teaching going on. The kids are learning some very good skills. Um, but it just doesn't seem to be as connected to the knowledge set that's expected. Uh, seems to be the biggest, biggest issue. Um, Big thing for RUHS is their students with disabilities are actually doing okay relative to the regular education population, but our graduation rates for our IEP students are not. They're not graduating for the reasons. Uh, RTCC is doing really well. Um, they got to focus on replacement programs. Okay. Um, if business goes, it should go away. Um, the forestry program to try to keep things at that desired enrollment level between 140 and 140. Uh, special education is huge uh, this year. It's something that we collectively probably need to talk about. Um, given that uh, there's some massive structural changes that need to happen to try to keep it possible. So that will be probably a big part of the discussion. Other than that, unless there's questions. to try to shift a lot of the associate's degrees um, out of the state colleges and into the regional faculty centers. But, but to create the pipeline to pursue that bachelor's. Yep. It's been an interesting change over the last year or so. Does anyone else have any comment or question for Lane about 
in relation to the Anselmo trial report. Okay. Thank you. Um, next, we have um, the first review of our budget for next year. It's like, is that something you were prepared to talk about? Uh, this is just a discussion on the board's needs for budget. Well, no, it was a. Uh, Originally, it was scheduled on the agenda. As I said, this was generally when we first see a first preliminary proposal from you for next year's budget. Yeah, and that be, will be next month. And okay. part of it is because the ends that we just discussed drive a lot of the discussions about okay. budget. But the, the piece that I have down um, was part of it is that the, the board has to determine its own budget. Right, that's the second, second thing. Determine board governance budget. Oh, gotcha. Sorry about that. Right. We did talk about this a little last month. Um, do you have something you want to add to that? No, just um, typically um, you, the board is at 10000 um, a year is what they've been putting in. Um, to kind of cover conference attendance, the DSBA membership, um, the kind of trainings that you want to do. If there are other plans um, that you have, either for training or whatnot, um, just to let us know so that we can actually go there. Right, and we do have a retreat coming up in, in November. Um, just a evening, particular retreat that is because it sounds so fancy. If we're just at the RUHS Media Center or somewhere uh, on Wednesday, November 20th, um, 639. Um, Susan Olson from the BSBA, I asked her to come and work with us on, uh, she's setting up some case studies um, as sort of a launch pad for our discussion about um, essential work of school boards. Um, so, um, everyone, I, I did email everyone, everyone so far has said that they will be able to make that one speak. So that is, goes for part of our budget. We will not spend that. No, I don't think traditionally, you know, I think the most of your stuff is that something. All right, so uh, discuss the negotiations with unions. We did, did get a letter um, from the unions um, setting up sort of a timetable. Yep. So they, um, as required under the CBA, um, they have moved forward in requesting to negotiate a successor contract. Um, that request is there. The reason <laughs> to really bring it up in the board and actually have it happen with the board and actually have a vote on it is because there's some stipulations attached to it. Um, I am recommending that we agree with those stipulations. Uh, basically, that we use the same ground rules that we did last year. Um, kind of um, the biggest of, of which was that those negotiations were open. In other words, the press could be involved and you know, people could hear strategy. Um, the other piece, though, that it also includes as part of those ground rules is that um, that very first meeting um, is dedicated to, to delivering you know, our initial proposals to each other um, and kind of moving forward from there. Remember that things are delayed this year. Um, that was part of the budget discussion that we could have um, due to the state of negotiations between the state um, and the state's uh, union uh, on health care. Uh, right now, they are in fact finding. I don't know if the fact finders report is it is public yet. I don't think back. It's, it's not yet. I think there's a 15 day window, so we're right in that. I thought, I thought, we were, oh, okay, I, thought I thought it was just you know, but I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. I, I could be wrong about the time. Yeah, they were saying they were saying any day. Um, so once that happens, they have an opportunity to kind of change their proposals, um, do kind of final offers if there's no agreement. Then it'll go to line of arbitration. Um, and at that point, which is in early December, um, when that happens, the arbitrator will take the best in whole. So, in other words, it's whichever agreement they get think is, is, is the most appropriate to take in whole. Um, so, until that's done, we can't really talk too much on budget and negotiations because we don't know what the monetary impact is. Right, it looks like the union suggests the first meeting for January. Yep, with the, with the logic appropriately being that, um, you know, if, if it's early December that uh, 
the, 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 they're going through the binding arbitration. It takes some time for him to write the report afterwards, and that will give us some time to digest which one comes out and then potentially alter our initial proposals. Right, it's really quite late for the budget planning yeah. process. And yeah. Yeah. Well, I do see, though, that they propose to um, that we forego the ground rules discussion. Right. Yeah, we just adopted it. Still, the first meeting mid January, generally, so still budget is really just about to clear up the question. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, last year, they asked to do both together. Um, they asked to do professional and support staff together. And I see the opening line of this say we like open negotiations for new collective bargaining agreements with both negotiations for staff. Mm -hmm. Is that the same question as last time? Or are they asking to open No, they're opening it because the support staff needs to be renegotiated as well. I know, but last year they asked to do it together. Yeah. So instead of Chris and Deb each holding up a separate board meeting, they would have one board meeting. And I'm asking, are they asking, because I see they both signed here, and they asked in the beginning for new collective bargaining agreements for both professional and support staff. Are they asking for two separate staff meetings, or are they asking for it to be combined? Like my, my, my belief, and, and Ted can, can correct me if I'm wrong, is that it was easier to send over one letter to open negotiations for both. That's my understanding, too. I don't think my word for it. Right. But if you if, if if you have a preference one way or the other, um, then you can definitely vote it. You know, we accept this on the following with the following right. understanding. With the following understanding, I think that's probably gonna be our best bet, just because yeah. I know they specifically asked to do that last time. Last year was it was Pietro that was the main that we got concerned about. I don't think it was. I, Paul, I don't think that our thinking has changed on that. Right. If that's where you're watching. Yeah. yeah. But I, would, I actually don't care one way or the other. It's just I think we should know yeah. one way or the other. If we're setting up two committees or one. And if there's a concern, I would so stipulate that in the motion. All right. Um, so I, we came tonight in part with something that's relevant to this discussion. I'm not sure if this is the right time to bring it up. I don't want to project the discussion if you want us to save it until later. You can move from Yeah. Um, does anyone have a to say no? Okay, okay. okay. I'll, I'll try to make it quick. Uh, but we, we, so we've got a letter here um, which is addressed to the members of the board. I won't read the whole thing, but you know, it's it's a letter from the membership of um, the OSCA, sort of, I think, uh, laying out some of what I think you already know what Lane has talked about, which is that these have been um, pretty contentious negotiations, which are obviously making process of local decision making on, on both sides of the table pretty difficult um, and are also coming off in a period of certainly the most like turmoil around health care um, in this profession of, of which is often known for how good its health care is and, and obviously that is driven by forces outside of this room, but it's a, it's a reality. Um, so in this letter, we're, we're sort of talking about um, some of the difficulties we've had um, in statewide negotiations with your negotiate, you know, your Vermont School Board Association negotiation team, which um, has um, been pushing a, a, a uh, what we would call a pretty punitive approach to, to negotiations that um, ha has really not been willing to um, hear some of our major concerns around uh, income sensitivity and premiums, which obviously, like, after another year of double-digit um, premium increases in health insurance, which you don't have to work in a school to be feeling. Obviously, that's across the board, um, but that, you know, that is something that is hurting our members, and particularly, I think, is of concern to our lowest paid members. Um, and the, the other thing that is really of concern is that there's been a kind of persistent um, argument that the, the lack of, quote, skin in the game on the part of employees is a driver of, of health, of increased health care costs, which I think, as far as I understand, there's not a lot of evidence to support and feels quite divisive and frankly ideological at a time when what we're trying to figure out, we think, is how to come up with like affordable health care that's also affordable to town. So um, as Lane alluded to, we're sort of in this, this window where there's one more opportunity to come back to the table. Um, 
haven't felt like, although there has been some movement, it doesn't feel like the Vermont School Board Association has, has given much movement toward our position or much interest in negotiations. They spent a lot of the time in the negotiations um, suing us or you know, filing a unfair labor practices um, what do call it? Um, motion over, over the number of alternates at the table, which seemed fairly petty when we're talking about the, the larger issue of, of, of health care for you know, dozens of thousands of people. Um, and so, so at the end of the day, we're hoping that um, perhaps hearing from some of the constituents, you know, the people who they represent, who I think, based on my interactions with you all as individuals, based on support that we've, you know, that we've been getting from you over the years, um, I don't think this is the OSSD school board's approach to healthcare negotiations speaking. And so we're just asking you in good faith if, if you would be willing to contact your representatives and express to them, you know, what, whatever, whatever you feel like expressing, but if we're hoping that it might be um, your wish that they would come back to the table and negotiate with us and seek kind of a common ground of affordability rather than this divisive skin of the game. Right? So, um, and I just want to give you this letter, which is a little confusing because we had to make a few copies to um, <laughs> distribute among all the buildings, but there is um, something like 80 employees have, have signed it. So, okay, so this um, is one copy from the... So that's the, so the front copy has everything on it, and I believe everyone's names, and then there's a bunch of okay. extra copies with people's Great. messy signatures. So, thank you very much. Cool. Thank you very much for hearing this out. Can I just add that I think, um, I think that this is sort of you know, treating a bigger problem like in a fragment. I think that if we did, you know, <laughs> I'm not here to pitch all sorts of things, but if we did have <laughs> universal health care, um, we probably wouldn't be having these nonstop grinds. And I think that we could probably, um, that would probably be a little bit more, it would be smoother. Because we do feel, I feel very supported by all of you. And it's the first time I've met some of you. Um, and I, it's more like human to human instead of like uh, talking to an entity. Yeah. So um, I appreciate your support and just listening to us. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Any concerns? We appreciate it. Uh, well, the budget piece is uh, you know, spend two seconds kind of talking a little bit and touch on some of the points that we made. Because uh, we have been, been looking at it as, as we're in the development process, but they're looking at a 12.49 percent increase in cost overall um, to insurance again this year, if everything remains the same, which is huge. Last year, 12.49 is it? 12.49 last year, depending upon which plan you were, were in, uh, it was it was different than an average now, to about an 11 percent increase. <laughs> so those have a huge budgetary impacts. Um, as part of the planning piece, to give you a little kind of preemptive before we go with it in November, uh, the special education department has put in a budget um, looking for a 24% increase, which is not going to happen. Um, but just to know the pressures that are out there, um, we do have a need uh, that we've talked about in the past that we can manage it for curriculum. We have significant need um, to help out the high school. We're going to people that need the supports. Um, the work that is there can progress, um, but it will just progress slowly. I have a partial structure in place with a few of our coaches that keep that issue. Um, the one worry that I have about bringing on a curriculum director, though, is that in three or four years, the work will be done and in a position that no longer strictly necessary. It might be better, this is part of the discussion happening now, is, is uh, to be preemptive on the budget piece. It might be better to bring in facilitators um, for the year to facilitate the discussions directly in math and science and the way to get the curriculums up and we're working with the PLC teams running that need to happen. And then the work is done. There's always tweaking that has to happen, but we can do that ourselves. Uh, they are starting from scratch. I have a question, and I do apologize, Laura, because I have notes from this initial discussion. I wanted to ask you, so if it's OK, yeah. it does go online. So in reading this, am I gathering that you would like to look at that curriculum coordinator for both math, English, social uh, studies, and science, or your four positions? Uh, no, uh, curriculum, yes or no. 
A curriculum coordinator um, is the best job in the world if you can get one. And we're the only district that doesn't have one. And the reason being is all you work on is curriculum. You do, you maintain some of the grants, you do some of the grant writing, um, but you work with the department heads in each department. So you're overseeing all the departments to guide the work that they need um, to make sure that they've got a well aligned curriculum up and running and to make sure that they're using tools to assess how the kids are performing and adjusting their instruction and the needs to be adjusted to make things better. That's okay. the purpose. But okay. that's Question. one individual. So it's one individual who oversees every single area. Yep. That's, you know, uh, we do have two coaches. We've got a math coach and an ELA coach that will continue. Uh, right now, their primary role is they're getting those um, assessments up, um, getting people trained on how to use them, the uh, SPAC interim assessments and the, the track of progress, helping the, the groups kind of interpret the data and, and see what they're going to do in terms of changing their instructional practices to make them better, but we're still missing basically. Um, and so that's a piece that's missing. But that would be one individual, uh, that curriculum that director. Um, the other piece, and again, this goes back to the board's ends, is the <coughs> librarians got together and put together a K-12 digital literacy curriculum for new technology. Um, we need a means of delivering it. Yes, it will be supported and embedded in the classwork that's happening around the schools, but I need my small school librarians here more than once a week to be able to help deliver that curriculum. That's a budgetary piece. Um, Braintree um, has, their staff has increased again to push them 100 um, student mark. They haven't really added any teachers. Um, so if we're going to keep the math work going that's there and have a dedicated, um, you know, grade three, grade four, grade five math as opposed to multiple grade, they're going to need another teacher. Um, and then the last piece that probably will have a positive impact on the budget as opposed to a negative. Uh, is uh, hiring the school psychologist. Uh, and the reason being is we're paying 200 some odd thousand to be testing to consultants outside us. For that kind of money, I can hire one here, pay them top of the line, give them top of the line benefits, having to do all that testing and help out with some of the emotional um, disturbance issues that we've got to help these kids. So that's the, the basic gist of what you're going to see in the, in the budget. Uh, doesn't mean we can do it all. Uh, but just like last year, what I'm going to lay down on the table is this is this is ideal to get us where we want to go, get us there relatively quickly, and then we pair back to the other things that what we've got to do in terms of what sense. So, part of my concern is that I want to make sure, I, I understand, judging by what you said, I drafted a few of your statements during the presentation, um, where you did share this has been a multi-year problem with this lack of curriculum, which as a taxpayer, as a parent, as a member of the school, it's very hard for me to hear um, when I have children in that school. Um, my concern, though, is right now we have a body of teachers, and that we're saying if there's a curriculum director, it's going to be better. That can't be a crutch this year at the expense of these students. And what I'm hearing over and over again, these scores are showing to me, is that our students are the ones that are suffering. And that's not, in my opinion, that, that's not okay at all. And to hear that if we just need more staff and it's going to get better, well, our population in the school has not been at a level that has dictated needing that staff. So where is that curriculum? Where is that guidance? And what are we doing today instead of talking about the problems of yesterday? How are we looking forward and getting better? The whole plan is out there. Most of what happened in terms of the budget process last year was to put structures in place to help things going forward. A significant amount was spent to try to switch over some of the special education model from providing academic support to kids that need emotional help um, to providing mental health. Right. So now, hopefully, that's going to allow them to actually be able to access the academic supports that we have. You have a K-12 director at ELA who is coming in, whose primary focus this year is the place that needs it the most, which is the high school. Um, who is working with that group to do two things. 
primarily it's to get the, the, those testing modules in place for the formative assessments um, because we still have to get the faculty and the rest of the community up to the place where you are at now, which is where there's a sense of urgency about it. And nothing creates a sense of urgency more than seeing the scores of the kids on those exams. I'm not hiding a thing, I'm doing it on purpose. Um, because people, people need to know so that they can get motivated. I also need the parents and I need the community to talk with their children about taking these exams and these tests seriously when they come in. Um, our scores would have been a lot higher, except a lot of the kids blew it off. I think it was 30% of the kids spent five minutes or less on this map. How do we know? Because it's a computerized test and that's the data. Okay. That, to me, says there's not a lot of sense of urgency about the importance of these exams. And what they do. The other reason that the testing is important has to do with what's called the theory of distributed practice. One of the things that I've noticed as I've been doing my walk arounds over the last couple of years is the students will often learn stuff very well right then and there in the classroom and be able to use it and apply it, but it's gone two or three days later. And we all have been there if we were granted for exams in college and whatnot. The purpose for having these exams spread out over the course of the year is because if you encounter the same ideas and concepts a couple of times, usually somewhere between three and seven, one, it sticks with you, and two, you're more likely to make stronger connections with the other things that you know so the information starts to take on more meaning than it had when you when you're visual learning. That's the purpose of assessment and testing. It's not to say, oh, you, God, you, you blew this and did really poorly and we're moving on. It's an opportunity for the students to revisit that knowledge, those concepts and the skills that they've learned in one more time in the course of the A lot of what we're seeing has nothing to do with formal instructional practice. There's pretty good, the practice is pretty darn good across the schools. It's a retention issue. It's an alignment issue. In other words, they're teaching stuff, but there's a body of knowledge they're expected to learn. We're not necessarily teaching that. That's why the curriculum is important because it guides it. Um, but there's also a retention issue. They're learning it in the here and now, two weeks later, it's not there. Um, that's, those are the two biggest, biggest pieces. So there are structures going into place, and in, in place this year to help. It just depends how fast you're going. Okay, so my final question yeah. is, um, and I tried to find the information you shared with us during the winter. Um, in this report you gave us, this you said that the average days missed per student across the district was 9.33. Um, the winner was the staff, that's the students. Right, the, this year is the students. I wanted to go back to the winter and the number of staff days that are missed. And we again look at these scores and I have to believe there's a correlation when our high school teachers are missing 20 plus days a year, and that um, inconsistency with the information that's being taught, I'd like to know who's holding those teachers accountable to be there when we expect our students to miss, we're upset about 9.33, but the paid staff is missing two times plus that. So you have, you have a lot of very good statements there. I'll start on the staff, and then we'll talk a little bit about correlations. Who holds the staff accountable? The CBA does. And right now in the CBA, they have the ability to take 28 days a year. And who is the CBA? <laughs> so it's what this board has agreed with the staff is appropriate. And how many days is that? 28. 28 days. So there's, there's a couple, and there's, a, there's two days in there that are a little quirky. Um, there's emergency days, there's sick days, there's personal leave. Uh, but they also have a clause in the contract that they do not have to make up the first two school years. So but the students say. Okay. Oh, it's built in. It goes to the 173, 175. That's, okay. I've never seen, and no, if you can get it, great, but, but I've never seen a clause like that in any contract. You're contracted for a certain number of days. Um, you shouldn't be losing two of what you've contracted for because of snow. They don't make them up. And so that's potentially two days that the kids could have um, that we're paying for the deal. Um, in terms of correlation um, piece, you're exactly right, because that was what the data showed. 
We threw out on the board, we took a look at the schools, we took a look at what the average attendance rate for staff was, and the schools that had the highest attendance rates, the most positive attendance rates for the staff were also the highest performing. The school that had the lowest performance was the lowest performing and went right in line. Um, and the last piece on the correlation that I, I want to mention, I kind of glossed over, but I think we do deserve some kudos, is one of the reasons that Braintree Schools enrollment has gone up by leaps and bounds as the highest performance in the district, and that's what Can I ask you a clarifying question about that data that you were referring to? Um, does does that average was that the average number of staff days that you whose number you're talking about attendance? Yeah, for, for, yeah, for attendance. Do, does that include or exclude staff on FMLA leave? So remember last year during class. Have to pull it all back up and look. It, yeah. it was time away from kids. Okay. Yeah. Just because I think that that might be a pretty significant factor, particularly at, as part of a cohort of people who's hired as 20-somethings that are now in that, that phase. I know that we had three last year, I think we have three this year, so that might be a contributing we did, factor to that data. We did a five-year study in the, the, of the data, and the numbers were increasing each year. So. Sure. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not disputing the numbers, but just just to you know think about how to characterize this source of that. That would be a, a important yeah. data. So they, they days days not in front of kids. Um, well, we should we should clarify if it's right. family leave. You know, I agree. Right. And, and also that wouldn't be affected by that part of the CBA because that's FMLA, which is a separate you know, statutory thing. Mm -hmm. But I'll go back. I'll go back and I can yeah, I just be, I just they have been looking at that for a year. Yeah. yeah. So. And I'd be curious about professional leave versus, you know, sick leave time as well. Uh, like if you're out it was combined, isn't it? The thing that was day, days out of um, Yeah, it was combined. So okay. you but, want to take a personal day, you want to take a sick day, you want to, whatever. There's 28 combined days, and then there was 20. So it was 20 of any one of those combinations. But I think she's asking that in terms of utilization, yeah. like how many of them were, were sick yeah. days versus professional well, days. One of, one of, one of Pieces. One of the pieces is the professional days, which I think I asked them not to have in there. But the professional days are kind of quirky um, because the, like Castleton, the, the group that does a lot of the, the training for the teachers, they're only offering them during the day, which is absolutely ridiculous. So, you know, do I just stop saying no unless you go on a Saturday or, you know, go on in the evening when you get your professional development? Right. Because which I pretty big grants that have teachers out for the, those trainings during the school year. But the, the, regardless of the source, the reality is, is that I think, think the average across the district, some of the schools hire some lower than 20. Um, on average, if you average it out across every teacher, on average, it's 20 days best for teacher. So that's a lot. Good questions. How do you more no, it's okay. It's good to make me hold the stuff up. There is a lot more that goes on in here than you can. You know, this information you had here, those graphs look really similar to the ones you showed last year. Elementary. That one the means the, the high school still look similar as we were talking about before. When when is enough enough? And you know, when are you willing to, to makes the changes that I, I did. They're going into place this year, the ones that we can do based upon the budget last year. Remember, the, the thing that held folks behind, um, and we've got a high school person here who can talk, how much of your time was spent for previous two years on standards-based report cards and graduation I, cases? Actually, it probably went more than two years. Yeah, it's, it's been a lot of time. That's where all the time is gone, and that was the same mandate. And, Candidly, I think for many years there have been many initiatives coming from the school board and central office from before your timeline that were not about these test scores, um, which I don't think we can dispute that point. Um, so, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm not saying it to, to dispute one either, but I think that, um, yeah, it, I think you're absolutely right in saying it's not where our attention has been going. Um, and it's not really been the message that we've been getting that that's where attention should be going until recently. So, 
And that's why that sense of urgency piece is, is so important. Um, I have the ability this year, it's already mapped out, but I'll be working with math and ELA on the curriculum. I'm not the best person to do it. I'm a curriculum person, um, but my time. I mean, that's yeah, it. and I'm just saying, you know, what that's what I'm saying is progressing as well. Next year. So if you, those numbers are changed quicker, you get me a curriculum director. You have to have the tools and the structure to do the job. You don't have the tools and the structure, and this, as far as I know, when I was asking people of institutional memory, there's never been a curriculum director yet, um, which explains, especially by the high school level. Um, we can't expect, and here's, here's the crux, um, being a teacher myself, um, teachers are not trained to create curriculum. You guys can argue with me if you want. They are trained to use, interpret, adapt, um, but it takes a facilitator to come in, and they're quite capable of creating one if they're facilitated the first time or two until they understand the process. Um, but they are not trained by nature to create curriculum from scratch, um, which is why you got to have that outside body. That's the crux of my research for doctorate when I was working on. I, I wouldn't see that. There's a sense of urgency in, amongst the teachers, though, that this is important. And, and, and in the elementary school, because I think 50% of proficiency is not good enough. Mm -hmm. I really don't. And I don't think we can you know, accept that as being, OK, so we've achieved 50%. I think 50% proficiency is it's not I'm, good. I'm, I'm glad I really don't. For, for our young students, I don't think it's near enough. But that's why it's the 50% is a significant improvement, but that's why it's the lower threshold. 70% is what you're saying. I, I was just going to say, oh, so. yeah, yeah. well, j just to the sense of urgency, I don't think you would find a lot of disagreement, at least among the high school faculty, at the idea that a focus on alignment and, uh, you know, my experience has been that I think I would dispute a little bit that we're not trained to create curriculum, but I, I see your point as far as like oh, the, the, bigger, the, actual the bigger picture. Yeah, exactly. I, I think you're right. And even if we are trained, it's extremely time consuming. It requires having contact time with a lot of people and synthesizing a lot of information. And my experience is that we've been, that we've been trying to do that in our, in our department meeting time for the last five years and something else keeps popping up. So, so I definitely, I guess I'm agnostic on the curriculum directive versus coach or, or whatever other strategies, but I think personally as, as a teacher in the school, I think the focus is right on. Um, and I'm in agreement with them on the use of the time. Yeah, I would say that like, you know, shifting from the way science has been taught to like, the NGSS and how it's taught and assessed, like it's a pretty substantial shift. And we've been making that shift, but it has been, you know, half an hour at four o'clock after teaching all day, getting ready to teach the next day. And so And then pick it up too. And then yeah, and then pick it up a month later where you're like, where are we again? And, and the purpose is kind of we talked about, you know, you build structure, you build curriculum, and then you you work on delivery. That's how you've got to build things if you want it to work. The purpose of the half days that was for you guys. Yeah. See, so that's a struggle I'm having in terms of capital and making sure that that time is preserved for the focus on that. It was originally intended to be honest on the trauma. So, so that's, that's what you told well, us last uh, year, was that? No, they, so the very first year I was here, so we back three years now, um, we put in those half days, those nine half days. Um, that was to give departments time to look at their data and adjust their instruction. Um, and that's as well. and I can tell you as a parent, I don't like the half days. They the whole day or not. As a parent. Well, the, 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 the logic behind it is it still counts as a full time. I know why I was going to say as a parent. I agree with you. I would just have the kid either stay home all day or go to school. Yeah, I agree with you. But you're saying that the time's not being used the way it's supposed to be used. I guess that's my it's not being it's, I, it's not being, it's being used usually for good purpose, but it's not being used for good job. It's not being used for academic. It's not being used for professional learning communities among staff on academics. So then my question back to you is, are our teachers aware of these scores? They, we talked about in first day of school, 
So if they're wearing the scores and they are given these half days throughout the year, for six or eight of them, however many there are, again, I guess I'm wondering where's, if I feel a sense of urgency as a parent and a taxpayer, I like to think that the people that are instructing my child feel the same way. That the principals leading that school feel the same way. And I don't, I don't sense that. I'm not hearing that, and maybe I'm missing it. Well, the, it's happened across the elementary level. I mean, there, which is why the scores are going up. That was due to a, a very tight, concerted effort. Um, at the high school level, take a look at the picture. Um, you lost a beloved principal to a scandal that required at least a year's worth of work to get people to recover from. It's like the death in a family. Um, people stepping up, learning new roles. I mean, there's been a lot of transition from high school. You have the PDGR, you have the proficiency-based graduation plans. But I'm in agreement there's not enough focus on that next, and then the principals know that, uh, which is why the K-12 uh, ELA and the math person is the issue. But yes. But uh, you've got to separate the separate the elementary from the from the high school. They are doing the work. They're doing a great job. Uh, things things are progressing nicely. Um, the high school has been engaged in in work. It just hasn't been on the academic. I don't want the teachers getting beat up. For that. It's not their fault. Um, they need time with a facilitator on the curriculum piece to develop curriculum and then to, to learn how to go and use the tools that are available to them or create new tools or bring in new tools um, besides to track my progress and uh, internal assessments to be able to assess how the students are progressing and kind of inform That's where they're, they're at. That's the <coughs> So math in ELA is happening, but unless the resources there and the structure are there to get people and to get the work going wholeheartedly across all the departments history ain't going to happen very fast. I can only be in so many places at once. And I have a full-time job given the fact that we also don't have an HR. And HR is my full-time job. Okay. Can I say one more Final thing? Final comments before we move on? Just to speak to the sense of urgency, I mean, I, I, uh, I just want to reiterate again that I think um, to me, it's the, the focus on test on the sense of urgency around the test scores is is very new. I think the sense of urgency around what our our kids needs. Like I have not worked a day at that school where there hasn't been a sense of urgency around that. Um, I think what there has been a sense of urgency around in the time that I've been there has been the inequities between students on IEPs and students not on IEPs, which. So the first five years I was there, we really worked on differentiated instruction um, around that in the advisory system, which I think are real strengths of our school. Um, there's a huge focus, I would say, up until a couple of years ago on relevance and 21st century skills. That's like a mantra we would hear very frequently from our previous superintendent and a lot of um, sponsored PD was we're preparing kids for jobs that don't even exist yet and a real critique of the sort of back to basics knowledge banking um, philosophy that, that I think is kind of undergirding a lot of the standardized testing. And I'll be frank, I think you know, as somebody who trained in teacher education over the, you know, in the post No Child Left Behind era, you're not going to find a lot of working educators who think very highly of standardized tests. I think Andrew alluded to this as the singular measure of student achievement. Um, and I think you'll find people who will concede different levels of, of their usefulness as like a, a broad-based measure. Um, but the experience, I think, of most teachers has been that there has been an obsession with, with standardized tests nationwide over the last 15 or 20 years that's been quite destructive to, to public education. And so I think that um, I just I wouldn't want you to interpret it as like a lack of concern for kids not learning. I think a lot of teachers are really skeptical of what does a standardized test teach you? I remember a joke that I was taught in graduate school, you know, getting my math, getting my um, teaching certificate about looking for your keys in a parking lot under a light 
when you maybe drop from the other side of the parking lot because the light's better there, and so it's metaphor for the light. Standardized tests are the best measure of what we can measure effectively with a single test, you know what I mean? It's not a great measure of a lot, a lot of things that are really, really important. And I say that not as like a way to avoid accountability, but yeah, you guys have a really important job about like what you put resources into, and I, I guess I do really, um, I, I think if what we're hearing from our board, our leadership is what we care most about is these standardized tests, yeah, we'll make that adjustment because we do care what you think, believe it or not, and we definitely do care about your kids. <laughs> that is not in the message we've been getting from the community, and I do definitely echo what Ann is saying about um, yeah, seeking, I mean, I think as, as a vice president of the union, that's some of the union would love to, to work with you on is like trying to take the pulse of what does the community want? What kind of measures of student learning does the community actually feel are valid? That's a conversation we'd love to have. So just wanted to share that perspective. And, and also that, you know, they, they are highlighting that, you know, our kids are struggling with reading and math. Um, and that, that that is our utmost concern every, every day, yeah. you know? Every day. And the, the reality is, is that the other stuff they've done wrong. That is up and running. It's going to continue to do that. You know, there's a part of my brain, I keep hearing my assessments teacher in college saying that we have to be very careful about standardized tests because there's a lot of evidence to suggest that they can be racially and culturally biased. And I remember that it's just like that's kind of what talks to me sometimes when I'm minimizing that in my mind to a point. I mean, definitely they're important. They definitely took a view of those students who took that test on that day didn't do very well, and that is a concern. But you know, I you know that's what I hear in my head. You know, and I think class class, class bias class is a particular yeah. concern in our community. Where if you're a kid coming from. Reflected in that SAT scores. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that that was, that was very revealing. But I think like one of the questions I might ask in trying to understand these, in addition to what is or isn't happening, is like, what are the kids' perceptions of these of these tests and and why they're meaningful? And part of that is messaging, but part of that is also life experience, right? And particularly because it affects your grade and your entire incentive to do well in school and try hard is on this kind of carrot and stick. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, what's my concern? I have to slip out. <laughs> no, thank you very much for your perspectives Sorry, and you're so. willing to come until 8.30 on us. I was going to say thank Monday. you for having us. Yes, thank you yes. for encouraging us to come out. That's <laughs> great. Thank you. We appreciate it. You're in the ones. OK, so we need to Back here, um, to have a motion to either accept or reject the use request to open negotiations. Do I have a motion? So moved. To accept the, the yes. Okay. Was that, um, which thing was yeah, um, yeah, I would like to um, question the motion. Okay. Since the motion's been made, or hasn't been second, has, it's been second, yeah. So uh, I'd like to amend it to. Um, We'll accept it with the understanding that it would be two separate meetings when we meet. It's not one combined meeting, meaning there will be a, a meeting for professional staff and a meeting for support staff. And they can even be on the same day, just. Okay, so I have an amended motion so that we would like to open negotiations for new collective bargaining for both professional and support staff but in separate meetings. Yes. I think. Okay. Is there any discussion about the amended? Unless you guys wanted to combine the two parties, but we've usually, it, it, they go on. Um, and quite frankly, when we get the teachers in the room, we'll be talking about them, and we're not going to talk about the sports staff. Uh, quite think, to be frank, separately. it's just going to be, if, if we do it separately, we'll be able to concentrate on both. Whereas if we just do together, we're not going to be able to do it. We don't want to do that. We'll spend three hours talking about the teachers and then last minute just say, all right, well, I'll just accept. Okay. 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 Take the motion as amended. Okay, all those in favor of the amended motion that we will like to open negotiations but in separate meetings, say aye, please. Aye. 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 Any vote? 
All right, so the amended motion is Adams. Uh, next is approval of facilities reserve funds. This is about the RES shed. So we had uh, kind of touched on this a little bit at the last meeting. Um, they talked about the fact that they used the wrong fasteners on the roof um, on that shed as well as the RTCC shed, and they are falling out. The you know, heating and cooling cycles just make them extract themselves. Um, so it's 12800 to do the work on that shed um, to replace the roof. Um, and then there's an additional 1000 or two um, to do some grading work to change the drainage pattern uh, around the building so that the water is not pouring into the shed. Um, so that's what they're looking for. So I forgot to put on the top of the figure. It's for the room for the rest of the year. Yeah. And that would be, you know, potentially if the board is willing to come from the reserve fund, that that would come to you pretty much. Um, it's more severe that's happening in this moment. And I saw Linda sent a, a later on the actual proposed estimate from Lajanese. Are there any more questions or discussion about this facilities with the reserve funds? Do we say not to exceed that amount of the 15000 you just said? Um, because their final bullet says that they might find they could uncover um, other issues and that the bill would be reflected then of additional time and material. So if we agree on that 15000 then it could be Okay. Which is fine. Okay. I'm just curious. Any, any, and I would argue any time we're spending that reserve money, people should be well aware of what's coming. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do I have a motion to approve fifteen thousand sixty dollars from the reserve fund to this um, and up on the Marshall School Shed roof? So moved. Second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. The motion carried. Next. Um, is the ends. Last time we discussed a little bit um, our board outreach efforts and we talked about uh, further defining um, our goals for outreach and then whether we need to review the ends. <coughs> so um, in that day we, did, we are holding this retreat on November 20th. Um, so that goes back to that board governance budget and the ends. Um, the ends are we have a copy of the ends in our agenda, but that was just for that. So those we will discuss our ends and where we want to, if we want to think about the process for reviewing and discussing them, finding them, um, we will also do that in our future. Mm -hmm. Lastly, um, board recognition process of faculty and staff. Yeah, Laura and I uh, talked about it at our last meeting. Um, Lane, we, we, we're not sure. What is the school district, does it currently um, do anything to recognize uh, A, outstanding faculty, staff, or for longevity? Or when somebody leaves, do we do something for them? Uh, if it happens, it happens within the local building. Yes, yeah, so uh, like can direct it's not. Outside of that, they have the teacher of the year that goes through the uh, process. Uh, I can recommend what I see happen in most districts. Um, one of the big failings in education is that um, teachers that receive tenure in, in Vermont after two years, um, most districts will invite those staff members to a board meeting that follows the September meeting and give them a, a little token to recognize that achievement because that's a difficult achievement. It's the equivalent of a doctor getting their cup. Um, other things that they usually do is on that opening day ceremony is they rec recognize longevity on um, the five year span. It's usually from the start of the 20 years to the 20 years. Um, usually it's a little momentum. So we, we were discussing, we like to talk with the board about it, but we like to try to implement that. And then one thing that was left out was uh, when we were talking about retirements, we should. Uh, so uh, maybe a standardized gift that's given to them, but more um, we need to know who's retiring ahead of time so that the board can um, you know, talk about it and give them a handwritten you know, letter saying thank you for your service. Like, you know, we get a, um, try to find a way to thank the educators and that 
you want to be the best, you get treatment the best. Mm -hmm. And right. right now, we're not. And so we're saying we want you to be so much better, but we're not doing anything on our end to say, here's ways of recognizing those of you that are doing really, really good things. It's also nice to do that publicly, right. forward-facing. I'm thinking right. in the newspaper, Instead of or in the school. Facebook, or right. something where you're saying these teachers that you know, they've been 30 years in their life. Exactly. And that would grow probably a lot of really positive response to hear right. from the past students. And, right. That's the idea yes. anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be good for us as a board to be doing that recognition. Right? Right. Otherwise, we establish relationships only in negative ways right. with our staff. And here we are trying to hire the best people and maintain and retain the best people, um, which I just think it, it behooves us to mm -hmm. to recognize those that we, you know, I think are doing a great job. Of, you know. well, why about, why? I don't want to, but I think we are here. But where in our job description does it say that's his job? But it isn't no. because it is it is our we don't hire he hires. I know, but, but we are the board of directors, and as such, I think we are in charge of him. We're not in charge of his staff. He is in charge of his staff. But we negotiate we contracts. Have to sign a contract. We have to do that by law. But he, right. the way our structure is, if we're following our policies, we are meddling in his business. And He's allowed to recognize the teachers for doing their good work. Right. I think as a board, we should recognize teachers for you know, tenure, for you know, longevity, and maybe for good work as well. Right? Right. I think just as public outreach and support of our staff. I, I disagree. It's not in our that we are if we're gonna be driven by our policies, which we're supposed to be governed as a board by the policies that we have, maybe we need to make a policy or add to a policy that says yet yeah, we're in charge of recognizing staff, but the only staff we're supposed to be directing is the superintendent, not his job is to do that part, not our job. And, it, and it, we're getting, we're meddling, we're getting, we've got to follow what our policies say. And if you can show me in our policies where it says we should be yeah, you know, well, dealing with well, let's change the policy. Yeah, we'll just change it then. Okay, yeah. well find the policy. I'm tired where of hearing say, you can't do things because of the well, what it's is a best the practice, practice of that. It's a best practice. For a manager, not for a board. Oh. No. I, mean, I disagree. <laughs> most <laughs> boards recognize there. Yes. That is a normal practice in most most school districts. Okay, the board I, I will do some research that. and see if you're following the governance process. I'm not worried about the policy governance. Well, like, I am because not. I think it's it's, not I think we're meddling. It hasn't worked because we haven't instituted it the way it's supposed to be done. Okay. Because it takes a little effort, and we're continuing to get into this. If you want to become a meddling board, then. Not Board. That's a meddling board, board that because does. our role is not to be directing staff or influencing staff. His job is to monitor, is to be directing the staff. Our job is to be evaluating him, making connections with the community, making sure that what we say we're going to have for ends are happening. We're not supposed to be telling him or telling the staff, oh, you're doing a great job, or, or I mean, we can in a very, but I just, it seems like time that might better be spent talking about how we're going to connect with the community is more important than these little, I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm making a mountain out of a molehill, but I just seems, I don't want to spend my time doing that. I want to spend my time focusing on making sure we're producing for the community the ends that our kids need to be able to move forward in life. And giving a prize or whatever, that's a manager. Signing a letter from the board saying thank you for 30 years is going to help with retention and help with 
handling these things. Really? Yes. They feel like they're a part of a community that cares. I well. <laughs> I think it's probably just we need to adjust our policy so we can grab. Yeah. And do it. Okay. If we as a board decide that that's what we want to move ahead with, we're just the policy. I mean, if we're going to follow policy governance, we'll make our policies match what we match want to what do. We're doing. So if we, okay. we want to do this. Find, yeah, find yeah. the policy in here and we'll add to it that we're going to recognize staff. Let's so add this to our agenda next um, month, so November, and we will do due diligence in, in searching for justification, either yeah. the policies that we have yeah. or decide what this is something we want to take on. I do, but I think it's probably best suited at that time because right now we are at 8.48. Yes. And I think it's not that important. <laughs> I mean, what would I have to say? Next, we have uh, ENDS monitoring. Uh, we have two reports, 2.1 and 2.2. It's our first reads. Do you want to talk about them? Yeah, the, the executive locations are they're pretty short. Uh, so EL 2.1 is uh, treatment of students, parents, and community members. Um, basically, in general, it's just making sure we have uh, safeguards in place to protect our information and have uh, clear protocols um, for folks to follow uh, when they're kind of accessing the district or seeking conflict resolution. Um, so those provisions I report compliance with. And then treatment of staff is EL 2.2. And in general, it's making sure the staff are safe, safe and treated reasonably um, following, again, well-established protocols. And I report compliance with that as well. Are there any questions? Um, we will all need to read as uh, these reports and then go into the, the OSSD office to check on background materials if you are still interested and then we'll vote to approve them or not next month. Okay, as you can see, we've got the behind visit uh, proxy. Um, so this is, um, Typically for these organizations, um, because they are an organization that has control over policy and budget, um, they need voting members. Um, so the proxy is typically the person that you vote to represent you at these meetings. Um, and so it's important to, to, to have a member um, who is willing uh, to do that, to both attend those meetings, the all member meetings, uh, and then be the voting member on behalf. And then they come back and notify them what is going on in the organization's future. So one of them is the, the Vermont Health um, Insurance Group, um, and the other is the, the DSBA Insurance, which covers stuff like our facilities and why. And I see both of these being placed on November 8th, not the 7th. So, and Kevin has volunteered or agreed to be the proxy, but however, can't go on the 8th and I can't go on the 8th either. I'm going on the 7th. I'm there both days. So we may have to um, just give them our vote, you know. Yeah. Unless someone wants to volunteer to go to the uh, DSDA meeting on. So we would have to, if we're ready to proxy, we would we not have to decide right now before we vote? Because you know, it's going to be mailed in now. Yeah. Or you can vote that you don't need to pop proxy says. Um, it says to appoint as it's truly lawful attorney the board of directors of the Vermont School Board's Insurance Trust by majority vote, the power of substitution for it, and it's name to vote at the annual meeting of the Vermont School Board's Insurance Trust. That means basically we give them out of vote that majority vote. We, we don't really have a choice unless mm -hmm. some of us can help. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, so we have the behind visit proxy. Um, I think it's time to go to our Favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. 
Um, next, we have the consent agenda. Um, we need to approve the minutes from the September meeting. Um, there are any substitutions for the next Please say so. And um, we'll approve the consent agenda as a slate. So we also have to approve professional staff contracts. We've got one new hire and then uh, two people are switching positions. They are all outlined in our packet here. So we've got three contracts to be approved. Does anyone, uh, is there any other discussion before we vote? Do I have a motion to approve the consent uh, agenda as detailed? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, reports. Thank uh, you. Report. I don't know if uh, there are any questions. I think probably one of the biggest thing um, is the exit 173, and we'll have that discussion with the, the, the big budget presentation next time and the potential impact um, that it's going to have. Um, in terms of cost, um, it's, it's really kind of hard to predict. Um, but given the state of things, what it looks like is happening is the state has recognized for the last five or six years that these costs are ballooning without bounds. They have no credible means to offer to fix it, and so what they're really doing is they're pushing it down to the level. Um, so either we figure out how to fix it on our own, or um, the towns themselves will be funding it through local taxes. Is this going to be as of the next? This, this up next budget? Yeah, I, I have to go back and check because they keep advancing things over what it was supposed to be. Um, but I think right now it's meant to be kind of half in place next year and then fully in place the year. So, um, so it's a transition year. And, uh, but every every six months uh, they decide that they're going to oh, we'll push off. There's so many unknowns going into this next budget. Yep. Um, other than that, unless there's questions there. In terms of the financial statement, I um, spent a little bit of time with, with Robin. We're actually in, in very good shape right now, um, but that may change depending on our current need um, in terms of students with disabilities once they can move into the district. But we'll talk about that once it's, I'm sure, the numbers um, next month. Right now, everything being linear, um, based upon an $18.5 million district budget, um, you would expect that we'd be spending $1.54 million a month, right, to use it up by the end of our year. Right now, we've been spending $865,000. Wow. I mean, some months there's more and some months there's less, but we're, that's usually a good indicator, you know, there's nothing that stands out in it, and that's a pretty good indicator that we're on target. That's a significant. Yeah, not all in the budget. Mm -hmm. What do you attribute that enormous difference to? I mean, 850000 to 1.4 million. A lot of the facilities pieces that we're going to be working on haven't been done yet. Okay. <laughs> we're just postponing this. That, that's the biggest. And then um, uh, a lot of it is the, the tra transportation transportation costs. Um, or just sure. less than you? Uh, well, they'll start to eat away as you go along. Go along so oh, okay. Once we get done. As people look at the, the financial uh, statements here, are there any other questions anyone has? Okay.
you know, in my learning curve, I'm still learning governance policy and exactly what that looks like within a meeting. Um, so this one I didn't completely finish, but I think overall the meeting did certainly run a bit off agenda, but I actually really appreciated the fact that there was two teachers here, or I don't know the call. Three, yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you teach us where? The text. Okay. I think it's nice that they were here, and I think it's nice that to hear their perspective and um, to have their their participation, I think is helpful. Yes, I thought that was great. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, so we didn't have a community engagement, um, I got an email from Casey Grimes, which I believe sent the link. Um, and he wanted me to, he, I know he responded to him, but he wanted me to bring it to the board about the middle school uniforms mm -hmm. are awful. And All of them or for a particular? They, they are been handing downs for 10, 15 years. And my son has to wear, he has got mismatched numbers, and he has an extra large jersey. And it's just that they've been handed down and they really look awful. And I don't, I don't know what you responded, but I know Lane did respond to it. So I, I, I respond, I, I, that is a question for Steve. I spent a good 45 minutes talking with Steve about it. It sounded like it had been resolved between the two, but I guess not. Um, Steve had said that he I haven't talked to Casey. Yeah. So Steve, Steve had said that the um, had spoken with him a little bit and said, "Hey, the uh, reason is because it's how the uniforms work. Is um, the new ones go to the varsity after a few years, they get handed down to the JV, and after that, they get handed down again. So right. they are correctly yeah. shaped. Um, and they're some of them are a little grungy, and some yeah. of them are mismatched. And and they had had a concern that they in the past they had bought some uniforms in relation to this for other teams that were younger, you know, that, that received them first. Um, and I asked Steve about that and the rationale as well. It was because of the size differences. Um, you couldn't have the girls and the singlets going out with the arms coming down here and people being able to, to yeah. see in the side. So um, I'm not opposed um, to so, and you the want to the more uniforms at all. I believe he said in his email mm -hmm. that he had brought it up nine years ago when he was coaching there. Yeah. And then again when his daughter was in middle school and now his son is in middle school and they're still the same uniforms. Yeah, I know Steve had talked directly with them in my yeah, I don't know, but, but if, if not, but I, I, I personally have this year we had it, we were playing the boys were playing in Waterbury. And I heard one of the Waterbury mothers mention about our uniform. You know, I think we had that type twelve years ago. So, you know, it, it kind of makes us look a little rattle off and type of stuff because they're, you know, we've got kids that are supposed to be wearing a small wearing an extra large. And, yeah, I mean, but, to put it in for budget consideration. Yeah, and I mean, I don't know what it would cut the cost to, <laughs> to re to get uniforms every, even every 10 years for just for the middle school, but he wanted me to bring that up to the board. Right. Um, is there any business? 